Maryland at the time. And in the state, it, it was as divided as the nation itself. So not only was is it divided on the issue of wanting to see the Gumby Union, but they were also still in debate and in constant in disagreement on the issue of slavery. And to help you understand in the difference in the dynamics, it's um, to understand it, it, you have to think about so a, on a geographic the perspective, because it brought most of the supporters is for slavery and also for her um, secession and were pretty much on the eastern and southern coasts of Maryland, while in the northern and western regions, and so they're more they're prone, prone to to being in in for for the federal government, and, and many of them would often describe it as union. So when you're talking, when someone can ask the question of, of, so what exactly are we looking at at Maryland during this time period? Well, um, you have to think about so people individually and also collectively. See, individually, see, I, 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 took a, I, took a, I took some time to examine and a gentleman by the name of Thomas Hicks, he was the governor of Maryland during in the Civil War. He was actually a very a adamant supporter of Abraham Lincoln, and, and he was probably considered the only open in unions as within the state legislature. And most of the legislators were interested in actually seceding from the union, and particularly when Virginia decided to, to leave the Union and join the Confederacy. See, see. So there's a phrase that that historians have used that Abraham Lincoln that would use is when describing the situation. And he said, when I look out of the window, so and I'm gazing in the south of across us my uh, across Washington and city, see, I see a foreign country, and he's describing Virginia. So to get the idea so, that you have Washington, D.C. sort of stuck in the middle of so, a sort of a barrier here between in the Union in North and the Confederate South. And his fear was if Maryland seceded it from in the Union, Entire their capital it would be surrounded it, it within in the enemy camp. Yeah. It would also make it easier for rebel forces to take over to Washington D.C. Also, so I found out that at least one third of Marylanders actually left left the state see, to join in the Confederate Army. So Lincoln decided. That he wanted to make sure that Maryland and in the main union as a border state, they, they along with Kentucky, Missouri, the, and Delaware. But he, of course, did not realize that this would happen. There were rumors that it would, that something like this would happen, and but but it wasn't until so one day right at the beginning of the war, or that he got, that he learned that Baltimore had erupted into a riot, but many pro-secessionists just sort of considered it more as the Baltimore Massacre. And what happened was the 6th uh, Massachusetts Regiment, and which was traveling by train at one point, and, and stopped near Baltimore, or, and they ran into some trouble on the railroad, it, so, so the troops, troops were forced to leave, leave the railroad and to march through, through Baltimore, or to get to the battlefield. Ironically, it was the first battle 
but they ran into the numerous pro-Confederate that sympathized with prison in Baltimore, or who actually taunted them through the bricks, stone, um, and then the troops ended up firing upon them, and it caused a major riot to escape, in which there was dozens of casualties on both sides. And so, after this event, Lincoln decided to place Casey Maryland under martial law, particularly he could have if any any pro the Confederate or pro secessionist sympathizers who were openly please speaking speaking out against the federal government tend to be to be arrested and and the act tends to prohibit habeas corpus is so they weren't weren't allowed to have have any any be held in the judicial system. They were just apprehended, arrested, and imprisoned. So, during my research, which I discovered that, that that on both sides, it's both the Union and the Confederates had had Marylanders there's within their ranks. And it's, it's certainly played true too with um, in the Union, and because Governor Hicks had decided to create a regiment in, in Maryland for, at first, the single purpose was to defend the state based on invasion. Um, in regards to, to Robert E. Lee, Lee and the Confederates, it, there's dozens of accounts where, where Lee, Lee actually he has is a regiment in, of Maryland and sympathizers actually were part of a singular regiment they called the, the first, first uh, Maryland Regiment. Um, what I have listed here is, is two major the, um, battles that involved Lee's invasion and into Maryland. And the first was the Battle of Antietam, also known as the Battle of Sharpsburg, which took place in September of 1862. And during this battle, so so General Lee and and the Union and General um, George McCullum and and actually he came to a stalemate. And even though McCullum and could have have captured Lee be at the battle, so being a gentleman and using certain conducts of war that, that were developed at this time decided to allow Lee to escape. However, Lincoln they would eventually use, use the battle of Antietam and claim it as a Union victory. And I'll pretty soon, I'll explain in my few minutes. But the other event <clears throat> which relates to the Battle of Gettysburg, it's very interesting because if you would have to think when Lee and his, his troops Army he had Northern Virginia, and they were marching through Maryland to get to, towards Gettysburg. Right? One must think about that those who were supporting the Confederacy were probably thrilled to see the, him, him and his troops marching through. Right? And you could probably they wonder that some of them probably even saw a few family members, their brothers, his father, his uncles, cousins, or even just friends. up to Gettysburg. And it's important to understand that during this time period, the tension in, of the, within the war sir, had caused some massive the problems for both sides. And the Union was in particular, the Union Army was particularly very adamant on trying to maintain control of Within Maryland, and, um, there's a book written by I think his name is Eric Mills, and he focuses on on um, some of the Union the Navy's um, role during in the war, particularly being in Chesapeake Bay, and their role was particularly to to monitor and survey the failed, failed um, Confederate 
Muslims, but also to keep an eye out for sort of pirates, smugglers, there's various just types of guerrilla bands. And so we're working along and with the Confederacy. Well, I decided to throw this one in, and mostly because because this was one of the major sort of issues with uh, Maryland was facing. And going back to what I was discussing about the Battle of Antietam, um, Lincoln decided to make the stalemate at Antietam a Union victory to sort of he can push forward sort of his plans for the Emancipation Proclamation. And his reason was he did not want uh, uh, the people who were supporting him in the North to suspect that that because because he was pushing for the Emancipation Proclamation that there was going to be a changing, shifting idea of the war against slavery. This was at this point, because before or, or at this particular point in history, the, um, Lincoln had, had made it clear that this war is to, to bring the Union back together. It's not about, about slavery. See, but a lot of abolitionists, including Frederick Douglass, just were, were telling him, this is a war about slavery. And if you want to win the war, you need to free the slaves, which can include African Americans and the, the US military. So, of course, there's in January of 1863, Steve Lincoln pushes his claim to the Emancipation Proclamation. And, and, and initially, the, the border states, it's, didn't, didn't didn't quite understand why he would do this. It's because they owned slaves slaves themselves, and they had remained loyal to the Union. <coughs> now, so once once the proclamation came forward, you can imagine and, and that it created an even wider drift with amongst Marylanders. And so so inside the Emancipation Proclamation, and Lincoln specifically explains that, that that I'm going to that every case state that is in rebellion and all all slaves that are in in those states is are to be to be freed. He mentioned nothing about about African American slaves, which are the border states, particularly in Maryland. And prior to that, in eighteen sixty C it it actually it ended its slavery capital, but just to, to get an idea of how Marylanders would react. And of course, many of them were not uh, too happy. I mean, there's accounts, accounts in various history books, including one by C.R. Gibbs, who wrote about of, um, the, a black regiment that was formed in Washington, D.C., where recruits which were being harassed as an attack by a Marylanders who were pro Confederates. It's, and last thing I want to say is that there were, there were quite a number of Maryland regiments that's formed within the all colored sort of infantry division. For my conclusion, I will discuss this on the debate of slavery and also end with Lincoln and the Lincoln conspiracy. So, so when can, can uh, when Lincoln decided to free the slaves and African American troops were included into to the Union Army, a, a lot of, of new members in the legislature, there, particularly in the House of Delegates, were now discussing about so so what we're, what are we going to do about the institution of slavery? Many of them um, wanted to keep, keep the slaves, even which was mostly in the eastern shore or southern region. Others who were anti-slavery, the advocate and abolitionist, wanted to end slavery. The, and some, some were, were discussing about a gradual emancipation. So to get an understanding also, Maryland was, was also divided in respect to their economy. 
starting to grow so tremendously in industry, particularly in Baltimore, there's there's a the canning and the shelling industry industry to do the moistures. And so eventually in November of 1864, they decided to, to And, and in order to have immediate emancipation. So, so it wasn't until, so, so the 13th Amendment came along uh, that slavery state in Maryland was officially abolished. There's, but it stayed, it was stated that for many historians, slavery in Maryland ended it one year, year before the Civil War ended. So, Around um, after, after the war is over, they're in 1865, it's only a few months. Um, Lincoln presents and his plans for reconstruction, uh, and, and which include through, through giving African Americans and the right to vote to a degree to their head for Pacific African. This led to this, of course, led to to um, John Wilkes Booth, who, who met with uh, John Surratt, at, at, and they organized. At first, it became a kidnapping and plan to kidnap Lincoln, but then it ended it with his assassination. And last thing I want to to say thank you, and also these are my sources that I use for my presentation and the reason why I chose this topic that is that that I didn't understand and to what degree it was Maryland and involved in the Civil War and also I didn't, didn't quite know as much about uh, whether Maryland was as divided as it as the nation was and from the research I've done Now we will entertain comments from our commentator, Dr. Curtis Johnson of Mount St. Mary's University. Uh, before I get started, I just want to thank uh, Charles for moderating this uh, uh, this session. Uh, Charles is uh, a graduate of Mount St. Mary's a history department, and a few years back he presented Pi Alpha Theta himself. And he's now working in our library as a librarian, and uh, he is doing a history of the writing a history of the Hagerstown Police Department and from when to when? Colonial Depression. Colonial Depression. So that's <laughs> quite a stretch of time. <laughs> and fitting it into the national story as well. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Charles. Uh, and now I'm going to give, uh, you've already heard this, my usual disclaimer, and that is that uh, I realize that uh, many of the papers which are presented here are shorter versions of a senior thesis and so sometimes I ask you to think about things that you've already thought about. And you put it in your paper, and now you had to pull it out. 
Uh, so I apologize if that's the case. Uh, that having been said, I thought all three papers were excellent, they were well documented, they had good primary sources, and they were carefully argued. Now, they all fit together, in some ways, totally obvious. Uh, it, uh, they're all dealing with political and social issues from uh, in the second half uh, in the United States in the second half of the 19th century. They, uh, to a larger or lesser degree, they all examine the activities of people who were to some degree marginalized by the larger American society. And furthermore, the principal in these uh, accounts all sought improvements, either <laughs> correctly or incorrectly, but at least they thought they were working for improvements in the lives of the group to uh, the people in the group to which they belong. So now. Uh, what I'm going to do here is make, just make a, uh, uh, some suggestions to perhaps expand the story just a little bit. Uh, and what you decide to do with that uh, in terms of further work is totally up to you. Uh, but the thing that I thought was kind of like a hidden actor in all of the presentations was the issue of gender. Uh, and I want to uh, play around with that a little bit. Uh, say a little bit about what was presented and perhaps how a discussion of gender might uh, add to uh, the discourse. So we'll start with Victoria Wright's essay, A Fight for Land Rights by Sarah Winnemucca, supported the Dawes Act. Uh, and uh, I'm a, not a specialist in Native American history, uh, and, uh, but certainly well aware of the Dawes Act, and I thought this is a very good corrective to the general story that is told about the Dawes Act. Usually it seems to be very clear, and for, uh, you know, the Indians were on, on one side and uh, uh, the United States government was on the other. And so when I first read the title, I was quite surprised. Okay, uh, why would a Native American woman support one of the biggest anti-Indian land grabs of the late 19th century? Hmm. Okay, my first impulse was, well, Winnemucca must have been a sellout. <laughs> well, not so fast. <laughs> and the story is much more complicated than that. And as Ms. Wright makes clear from her essay, Winnemucca was vitally interested in, quote, preserving Numa's rights to the lands they had inhabited for hundreds of years. And so the rest of Ms. Wright's essay carefully explains how Winnemucca concluded that the Dawes Act was seemingly the last best hope for her people. First, it would end the corrupt reservation system and its reprehensible agents, and also uh, and would allow uh, the Numa to become farmers with title to their own land and become self-supporting. Secondly, uh, land ownership would allow the Numa to distance themselves from white settlers who would often attack and rape Numa women. Now, as she explains, uh, the Dawes Act did not meet her uh, Winnemucca's expectations. But this does not mean that her strategy was entirely misguided, because we have to remember that in the same time period, African Americans in the South were desperately trying to get their own land in order to escape the sharecropping system. That was the whole hope behind 40 acres and a mule. It didn't happen, and African Americans were trapped in the Southern agricultural system for generations. And so other people were trying the same strategy with probably the same kind of results. So, uh, in terms of the issue of gender, um, it might add to the story which Ms. Wright has already presented in terms of how Winnemucca tried to traverse the troubled politics of this era. Uh, she had to navigate between two constructions of gender, uh, that of the Numa and that of white America. As with most native societies, the Numa offered women greater opportunities for leadership than what was the case in Anglo culture. Uh, Sarah Winnemucca took advantage of these opportunities and became a nationally known lecturer, educator, advocate, and author of one of the most enduring ethno-historical books written by an American Indian. So she took advantage of the uh, op gendered opportunities that she had within her own culture, but at the same time she had to navigate the very different gendered expectations in the dominant white culture. And as you point out, at times she did protest and wrote letters of protest, uh, but the impression I got, and, and you can correct this in the Q&A session if I got this wrong, my impression was that generally she kept, the, uh, kept her foot off the pedal to a certain extent. She, didn't, uh, she relied on persuasion, trying to manipulate the system rather than directly challenging it, because uh, to challenge the system would go against gendered expectations in the white power structure. And so probably considering the gender politics of the era, her strategy was probably the best that she could do. Moving to Catherine White's essay, Britannia, Wellington, Peter Kennan, 
uh, America's first curator of Washingtonania. Uh, here's another woman who had to navigate two worlds, the Confederate world and the United States world. And she had to do it very, very carefully. Now, as was pointed out, uh, Kennan was a descendant of Martha Washington, who was the owner of a Georgetown home, Tudor Place, and a vast collection of artifacts once possessed by the nation's first president. When the Civil War began, Kennan, a Confederate sympathizer, was in danger of losing everything. As you pointed out, many homes owned by Southerners had already been confiscated by federal officers, and Tudor Place could have been next. Ms. White shows in careful detail how Kennan navigated the troubled waters of Civil War politics. She was cooperative, and she used Tudor Place to take in Yankee borders and avoided any discussion of politics. Here we can see how Kennan presented a non-threatening, feminine approach to her situation. She was a widow, had no man to protect her, and was cooperative in the extreme. Her silence on politics was not only wise, it fit the era's expectation that women to be were to be private, non-threatening, and quiet on public matter. She played her role well, and despite her pro-Confederate sympathies, Tudor Place and his collection of Washington's possessions were safe. So gender, she played the gender card very, very well. Gregory Foster's Divided Brotherhood, Maryland during the Civil War, describes how Maryland, like other border states, was deeply divided over the issue of secession. Like other historians, Mr. Foster examines the divisions among the white population and points out how these divisions were basically based on geography and uh, 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 but then he goes a few steps further. So usually the story kind of begins and ends with the American, uh, Maryland disputes over secession and the vote not to secede, which took place further south in this county in Frederick in 1861. So that's usually where it begins and ends. However, he goes a few steps further. He points out that the divisions don't end with secession that actually you have the issue of race and black enlistment. And so what you get is a racial dynamic as blacks are fighting to win their own freedom in the war. And then concludes by pointing out how secession, uh, uh, how uh, there is a discussion about abolishing slavery at the very end of the war, which once again divides Maryland uh, 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 in a different direction. So you have the initial division over North and South, then you have another division between on the issue of slavery and the enlistment of black troops, and then you have another division in society in terms of what should be done uh, in light of the outcome of the Civil War in terms of abolishing slavery. And so it's not just one slice, it's Maryland sliced in many different directions, and I think this is a more full and complete picture of what happened than what we often get. Now, <clears throat> the issue of gender. Uh, men on both sides of the war uh, certainly fulfilled their gender roles as militant protectors of tradition, hearth, and home. They were activists, shapers of their societies. They did not seek to navigate difficult situations as did Winnemucca and Kennan. They took matters into their own hands. Maryland's John Wilkes Booth and his band of conspirators used this approach when they conspired to kidnap and, as it turned out, assassinate President Lincoln. But what about Mary Surratt, a woman who was hung as a co-conspirator? Mm -hmm. Not only had Surratt participated in a heinous crime, she abandoned the woman's role as a passive negotiator working through existing patriarchal arrangements. Instead, by involving herself in the conspiracy plot, she became an active protagonist of major change. In the end, Surratt was convicted and hanged, becoming the first woman executed by the United States federal government. Her unusual penalty raised the possibility that violating other <coughs> norms also contributed to her conviction and execution by the United States government. In short, if you commit a man's crime, you can expect a man's punishment. Once again, I thank all three authors for their thoughtful discussions on these important historical issues, and I think it's now time for the Q&A.